right, all right. Hey, we finished Immerse Beginnings week one. How you doing? Yeah. The number one comment I'm, I'm hearing is, I'm asking, how's it going with, with Immerse? How's it going with Beginnings? Is the readings are shorter. <laughs> yeah. Takes less time. Amen. Amen. Well, we have made a commitment to read the Bible through in two years. We finished the New Testament earlier in the year. Now we just started the Old Testament, first five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch, and uh, it's right here. And as you know, we already said, they're out in the back. If you want to get a book and hop in with us, it's never too late. Okay? Uh, so I, um, I, I, I know that the Old Testament it's kind of like the deep end of the swimming pool. How many know what I'm talking about, right? And to just get started, I mean, we're committed. The next year and a half, we are going to read, listen, Chapel Springs is going to read the Old Testament all the way through in the next year and a half. Amen. But it's a little scary. When you went swimming when you were a kid, couldn't swim very good, you stayed in the shallow end, and it was only the big kids that could swim that went out in the deep end, right? And, and it's one of, my, one of my goals is to take the fear out of it. And in fact, we're just going to say that every Sunday during this series right now, it's going to be swim lessons so that you can swim in the deep end Monday through Friday. Amen. So we got resources for you. They're in the bulletin. If you've never checked out BibleProject.org, the BibleProject.org, check.com, check it out. There's awesome video explanations of every book in the Bible. You will love it. It'll help get you contacts. It'll help you out. And so another goal for me is to convince you why it is so absolutely important that you read the Old Testament. Why, Pastor Scott? Why? Why can't we just read the stories of Jesus in the New? Why do we read the Old Testament? Because, people, we read the Old Testament because when we read it, we are connecting with our story. Amen? This is not just God's story, but because you belong to him, this now is your story. Before you met Jesus and you had your story, you were trying to figure it all out, right? Friends, one of the things you do when you come to know the Lord is you step out of your story and you step into the story of God because that is now your story. You want to connect with your ancestors? Don't go to Ancestry.com. Read Genesis and you'll connect. Amen. It's our story. Why do we need to read the Old Testament? Because, people, this is the Bible that Jesus read. This is the Bible that he memorized. This is the Bible that he quoted. This is the Bible that, that God used to bring him close to the Father. This is the book that he read when he was uncovering and discovering through the Holy Spirit his mission to go to the cross. At Chapel Springs, we've got one goal, helping people follow Jesus. Jesus read the Old Testament. You should too. Amen. Third reason why you need to read the Old Testament is because this book is filled with Jesus. It's not just the one he read, but it's filled with Jesus. Luke chapter 24, after Jesus was resurrected, he's having a conversation with his disciples. And he says to them, everything written in Moses and the prophets and the poets, that everything written about me must be fulfilled. All, everything in the... Everything in the Old Testament that was written about me must be fulfilled. And it says he opened up their minds and their hearts, and he helped them understand, right, where, how everything that was said about Jesus in the Old Testament. Can I tell you something? Today, before the end of this service, Jesus and his gospel himself is going to jump right out of page 21 out of this book and smack you right upside the head. I'll guarantee it. He's filled with Jesus right here. It's filled with Jesus. And so when you immerse in the Old Testament, you're immersing in Jesus. Now, didn't Dr. Stephanie get us off to a great start last week? I mean, what a sermon. Wow. Wow. What a sermon. How she presented the Mona Lisa, Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, man, the glory, the beauty of creation, the purpose of creation, the glory, the beauty, the wonder of our creator. And we got to learn some cool Hebrew words can't quite remember them. Remember the cool words? I don't know, wahoo va tofu or something. I don't know. You know, it was something like that, right? What does it mean, formless and void? Isn't it amazing to think that God, the creator, comes in to the chaos, the formlessness and the void, and he brings order and he fills it with purpose. Hallelujah. 
Man, if you missed it last week, go to YouTube, get on our Chapel Springs channel, watch it. Fantastic message. But then we know what happened. We go today to page 10 in our Immerse Genesis Beginnings book, also known as Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. We understand that as glorious as creation was, we human beings created in the image of God, rebelled against God, and we messed everything up. And in fact, we messed everything up really bad. Turn to somebody and say, you messed everything up. Just tell them, right? Now. You did. Bad! How bad is it? So bad that the writer of Genesis is going to write this. Check this out. Look at this. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. And then I love that last statement. It broke his heart. Now, my Immerse group meets on Thursdays, and when we responded to one of those early questions, what stood out to you the most, on everybody's short list was this kind of a thought. Man, I'm appalled at how sinful, how evil, how wicked human beings are. Even the ones that made it in the Bible. I mean, Bible characters, I mean, they should at least have, there should be a bar, shouldn't there, for people to make it in the Bible? No, sir. Whether you're in the Bible or out of the Bible, we are a mess, aren't we? I mean, it's just true, right? Cain kills Abel. How about Abram lying, not just once, but twice to a different king about his wife, that she's really my sister? And then Pharaoh takes Sarah to be his wife. I've heard people ask the question. I've had people ask me the question, did, did, did Pharaoh and Sarah actually... And I say, you go ask Pastor Stephanie and Dr. Doug. I right? don't, I, you know. <laughs> Lot offers his daughters to be gang raped. Later, Lot's daughters get their father drunk so he can get them pregnant. I mean, brothers and sisters, here we go. Listen, swim lesson number one in the deep end. God is the only hero in the Bible. Now, we can learn stuff from other people. I mean, we, we, we're, we're going to learn a lot from these characters, mostly about what not to do, right? But God is the only hero. But I notice what it says about him. It says that when he saw all the evil, when he's in his immersed group, and, he, you know, what, what is God telling, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that, you know, agreeing together, man, their heart was broken, right? This is bad. This is, this is bad. Friends, listen. A broken heart is how God feels when any of us are running from him and messing up our lives. If you find yourself in church today and you've come to see if we got anything to say that might be helpful and you know that you are running from God and your life is a mess, I want you to know today, brothers and sisters, that God's attitude toward you is a broken heart. He's not filled with vindictiveness. He's not, can't wait to get my hands on you so that I can punish you. He already knows that your wayward sin is punishment enough. The consequence, I mean, the poo-poo that's coming down on your head right now. God's heart is broken, but isn't it awesome when we realize that our story, our story, our ancestry, our story is this. It is a story of redemption. Amen. It is a story of God not giving up on us. Amen. He runs after us when we've messed up with a broken heart. He doesn't get, he finds Noah. And even if you haven't been reading with us this week, you know how the story went. God's about redemption. He's not going to let anything stop his story of redemption. He finds somebody he can work with, right? Listen, friends, God always finds a way to advance his story, no matter how bleak things might be. We need to keep praying for America, amen? We need to keep praying for this nation that we live in. I know that many of you are appalled, especially if you got gray hair. You can't believe how quickly things have gotten so bad, and you're just like, things are topsy-turvy. Advancing this redemption story, it only takes one. 
If he's just got one, he can keep it moving, right? Do you know what you ought to have as your life mission? Here's, here's a good life mission we can learn from Noah. Lord, if my life means anything, if it counts for anything, I want my life to keep advancing your story. How do you do it? Because in, in, in our Immerse group, one of the ladies said, man, I, how in the world did Noah hang in there? I mean, every, can you imagine? Everybody's wicked except for you and your family. Can you imagine? How do you, you know, how do you deal with that? You're looking to the future. You know, man, what's going on? Uh, you know, how am I going to, what about my grandkids? What's going to happen? Brothers and sisters, listen. Hey, we're going to keep advancing the story if we're hanging on tight to God. Come on, amen. Hang tight to Jesus and do not compromise truth. Come on, amen. Don't compromise truth because God will advance the story if you stay faithful to him. Amen. This is better preaching than what you're letting on today. There ought to be a lot of amen. He finds a way. And so we know what happens. He builds the ark. The water subsides finally. The land dries. No one his family disembark. God repeats the commission that he gave to Adam, right? Changes it up a little bit, tweaks some things. I'm thankful he added steak to the menu. Can I get an amen for steak on the menu? Yes. Tweaks some things. And then for the first time, page 13, middle of the page, Genesis 9, 8, an important theme is introduced to us that we're going to be able to track through the entire Bible. Look what it says. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant, underline covenant, highlight covenant, with you and your descendants. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Now listen, the story of redemption is the story of God making a series of covenants with human beings. It's the cultural uh, tool that he used. It's the way in which he partners with a select person or a small group of people to reveal himself to the entire world. And it's the primary way that he uses to rescue the entire world. So this idea of God making a covenant with Noah, it's the beginning of a theme you're going to be able to track all the way through the Bible, all the way through the Old Testament. It is the way in which God is revealing himself and the way he is rescuing the entire world. Amen. It's through this idea of an ancient covenant. We find it in the Bible and it's defined like this. Here's the definition. A covenant, biblical Ancient covenant is an agreement between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance. That's a covenant. Now, God's covenant with Noah was one-sided, wasn't it, right? I mean, he just says, listen, we're not going to make a mess out of things through a worldwide flood anymore. We're not going to do it. It's not going to happen again. He makes a promise, gives a sign, the rainbow, right? Now, here's what we need to understand, friends. The ancient world was very familiar with the practice of covenant making. Now, remember, this isn't just a sermon to inspire you. These are swimming lessons today. So let me teach for about five minutes. Don't freak out. Hang in there, okay? Because the idea of covenant... It's not something we're familiar with. So it's another one of those kind of esoteric kind of things that are a little foggy. And, 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 but in Abraham's world, listen, their whole society, their culture was immersed in this idea of covenant. It permeated their culture. They didn't have to think about it. It was so much a part of their life. You see, back then, blood family meant everything. Your family meant everything back then. Think about it. And, and, and if you were going to survive, obviously, you were gonna, there were going to be times when you needed to, you need to get into a covenant with maybe somebody else that wasn't actually your blood family, but you needed to treat each other like blood family and be able to call each other brother, right? And so you would make these covenants, right, these promises to one another. It was the way the whole society Function. Then in the Bible, we're going to run into two basic types of ancient covenants. And the first one is the parity treaty or covenant. And the second one is called the suzerain vassal 
treaty. Now, I know suzerain, that's another one of those, you know, wahoo tofu words, but it's an English word, all right? And I don't, I don't want to freak you out. So it simply means the big shot, the overlord, the godfather. It's the guy with all the power, all right? It's the suzerain, right? It's the king. It's the over, it's the big king. It's the big kahuna, whatever you want to call it, okay? So there's two basic types of treaties. And the first treaty, the first covenant is a parity treaty. This is between people that are equals. We read about one Thursday when Abraham entered into a covenant with Abimelech. It was a parity treaty. Now, when it comes to the covenants that God is going to make with, 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 with uh, people in the Old Testament, God could never make a parity covenant, could he? Because nobody is equal to God. doesn't have any equals. So any covenant that God makes, it's going to be, he's more powerful. It's going to be a suzerain vassal treaty or covenant. And those are the covenants we see in the Bible. This is a covenant where one party has more power than the other. And this agreement, this covenant, it created a Lord-servant relationship. Now remember, this, this was the societal tool that God used to reveal himself and rescue the world, right? And so this is the type of covenant that God is making with individuals. And in the Old Testament, there are four major of these suzerain vassal covenants. The first one we've already looked at today, it was the covenant he made with Noah. I'm not going to try to trick you here, okay? Don't be afraid to answer if you're reasonably sure you got the right answer, okay? Noah. The one we're going to read here in just a minute in Genesis chapter 15, around page 2021, is the covenant he made with Abraham. And then Abraham's people, ancestors, are going to become the nation of Israel, mediator being Moses. But then there's going to be one special king out of the nation of Israel that God's going to make a fourth covenant with that actually is going to catapult us to the fifth great covenant of the Bible, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it's the covenant he made with David. Now, okay, so here we go. Here we go. This is a great swimming lesson that's going to help you swim in the deep end. Let's go over this. We can do this. Let's name the four major covenants in the Bible. This is how the entire Old Testament is arranged. We're going to start over here with section A, Dr. Doug's section, because they are so brilliant. Here we go. Let's do it. First covenant is Noah. Second covenant is Abraham. Third covenant is Israel. That was kind of weak. Fourth covenant is David. Let's try it again, starting this way. Friends, we're going to keep doing this till you scream it loud and clear, all right? You're going to thank me Thursday. When you're reading, you're trying to swim in the deep end. Here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> Noah, Abraham, Israel, David, Noah, Abraham, Israel, David. You are all going to swim in the deep end this week. Hallelujah. Amen. No belly flops. Cannonballs only. We're jumping in. That's how the whole Bible is structured. And remember, each covenant reveals something of God, and it advances the story of redemption. And so we learn something about God, and we learn something about redemption from the Noah covenant. But when you get to the Abraham covenant, we learn even more about God, and the story of redemption advances. And then by the time you get to Mount Sinai and the nation of Israel and Moses and the smoke and the fire and the Ten Commandments, you learn a little more about God, and the story of redemption advances. And then when the second great king, David, the man after God's heart, God makes a covenant with him and says, there's coming a son of David in the future whose kingdom will never end. Those are all the covenants that bring us to the fifth covenant. It's called the new covenant that God is going to give us through who? Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Yes. That's the flow of the Bible. Now, here's what we know from ancient sources about Lord Vassal Covenants. The Suzerain, the Suzerain had authority over the land and the people of the vassal tribe person, the, the servant. Second thing we know is that the suzerain provided protection for the vassal, military protection. A lot of smaller tribes would, would enter into covenants with bigger uh, kingdoms. Why? Because if, if uh, Egypt begins to impinge on the little postage stamp land of Israel, then you want to have somebody bigger in the neighborhood to, fight, to help fight the war. I mean, it makes sense, right? And so 
But here, so here's the other thing. The vassal typically received a grant of land from the Cicerim and had to pay a tribute to the Cicerim from the produce. Do you get that? The vassal owed the Cicerim exclusive loyalty. Now, listen to how those four points help us understand the Old Testament just right there. Think about it. If in a Cicerim vassal covenant, the Cicerim owns the land and has authority over the people and provides protection for the vassal. And if the vassal gets a land grant and has to pay tribute to the suzerain, and if the vassal owed the suzerain exclusive loyalty, think about how much of the Old Testament begins to clear up. Why did God give Abraham land? Because it was the grant from the suzerain. Why does Israel pay tithe and honor God with the sacrifices from the fruit of the land and the flock? Because the vassal owed that tribute to the Cicerone. Why, friends? I mean, think about this. Why is it? Why is it that God says you shall have no other gods before thee in the Ten Commandments? Have you noticed that's commandment number one? Why? Because in that culture, if you're a vassal, you can't be making covenants with a bunch of different kings. You've got to give exclusive loyalty. Amen. Now, there's this term, if you're loyal to the covenant, and it's found all over the Old Testament. It's found, so, it, there, it's used so often. There's mo it's such a wonderful word. It's a variety of words are used to, to uh, 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 translate it, loving kindness and faithfulness and mercy and sometimes just love. It is the Hebrew word hesed and it is the word that simply means covenant loyalty. When you are in a covenant and you are loyal to that covenant, that is one of the great qualities, characteristics that is championed in the Bible. Why? Because all of society is based on covenant keeping. And so when David is composing a song and wants to brag on his God, in Psalm 63, verse 3, this is what he says, Thy loving kindness, O God, is greater than life itself. In fact, we used to sing a song like that. In fact, in youth group, many years ago, when Dr. Doug was a teenager, we had a song, and that was a very long time ago. But some of us know it, right? Now, Doug, don't sing the entire song like you did last service at 9.30. Get the tape, all right? But let's sing the first stanza together. Come on, are you ready? Thy loving That's it, stop, stop. <laughs> Think about it if you've been introduced to the true and the living God and the way in which he's revealing himself and the way in which he's going to redeem you and rescue you from the mess you've made of things is through covenant. And think about how powerful it is to be able to stand up and sing the fact that I serve a God who will not ever break his promise to me is greater than life itself. Mm. Mm. Wow. Now, friends, in this covenant, it was sealed with a special ceremony. Oaths were taken, commitments made that were always ratified by the sacrifice of an animal. And so in the scripture, when you read the phrase, and God made a covenant with Abraham, the word made literally means he cut a covenant with Abraham. Why? Because there was always an animal that was sacrificed. Not just in the Bible. This was true throughout the ancient world of covenants. A lamb would have his throat slit. And one of the purposes of it was when you're entering into the covenant, what you are saying is, this will be you if you ever break the covenants. Right? Wow. And so check out this uh, statement from an ancient source, not the Bible. This comes from Mesopotamia in the 8th century B.C. As a lamb is being split open, as there is a covenant being, f being ratified from, by a cicerone, with a vassal, look at what it says. Apparently, this individual's name was Mateilu. That was the vassal. Look what it says. This head is not the head of a spring lamb. Now, now picture the spring lamb's 
bleeding out. <laughs> Church people think this kind of stuff is funny. I don't get it. I mean, it's just... You know. This head is not the head of a spring lamb. It's the head of Mata'ilhu. It is the head of his sons, his magnates, and the people of his land. If Mata'ilhu should sin against this treaty. Aren't you glad when you closed down your house and you went to the rat and you went to the closing that there wasn't that kind of language in it? Right? Sometimes the animal was literally cut in two, and the parties or the lesser party walk through the blood in between the pieces. There's a reference to this kind of eradication ceremony in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah's day, the people were, I mean, the, the, the evil was so great, it was almost time God was going to shut the entire thing down, and they were going to go into exile, right? And one of, the, one of the things they were doing is they were no longer practicing the practice that God prescribed to release all the Hebrew slaves every seven years. You see, if one of your brothers or sisters, one of your Hebrew kindred, if they became so poor that they had to sell themselves to you and become your indentured servant, they could only serve you for a maximum of seven years. Every seventh year. Year, the slaves were set free. Well, Israel stopped practicing that. The people in Jerusalem stopped practicing that. And Zedekiah, the king at that time, said, enough is enough. You're going to let the slaves go. And, and in order to make that happen, we're going to cut a covenant. Well, what happened was they cut the covenant. They let the slaves go. But then the people changed their mind. Look at what Jeremiah writes. Look at what God says through the prophet, chapter 34, verse 18. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walk between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies. And that's exactly what happened when the Assyrian the Babylonian army came in. What happened? They had cut a covenant with the king, but didn't remain faithful to it. No hesed was in their hearts. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 15. And I know what you're thinking. Heavens, it's 12 o'clock. We're just getting to the text. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. Remember, I promised you by the end of the sermon, Jesus is going to jump right off the page. Something to stick around for. <laughs> Amen. So we get now to Abram, Genesis chapter 15. And uh, it's been a few years now when you get to Genesis chapter 15. By the way, I'm in first, uh, page 20 in your immersed Bible. So a lot has happened. God called Abram out of his pagan family. He called him out to leave his idols, his paganism, his idolatry, his polytheistic ways, his family, his kin, and come follow this God called Yahweh, who he didn't know, we know, the true and the living God, the creator God, right? Amen. And I'm going to take you to a land that you know, and he, and he did it. Amazing. Amazing. He did it. And he gets to Canaan, this little postage size stamp, little, right in the middle of the intersection of the entire world, and, and Abraham is pitching his tent, He's building an altar. He's calling on the name of this God that he's just met, right? And, and then there's a famine. So this is when he goes to Egypt and he lies about his, about his wife, calls his sister, and that whole thing with Pharaoh takes place. And then he, he comes back, and now years are going by, and, and, and he's got to separate ways with his nephew Lot. Lot, which land do you want? Because we're too big for here. And they, they separate. And then Lot becomes part of this big mess of a battle that happened between kings, and Abraham goes and rescues Lot. And now all that's happened, and it's been years now since he first met this God. And this is what it says. Sometime later, the Lord spoke spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you. Boy, will be great. Now, Abraham's thinking, yeah, you said this to me years ago. I'm going to be a great nation. The whole world's going to, you know, be blessed because of, because of me and my offspring. And so he says back to God, God, how great can the reward be if I don't even have a son? I don't have any kids. I mean, my servant Eliezer, he's the one that's going to inherit everything. And God says back to him, hey, listen, no, no, your servant's not going to be your heir. You're going to have a son from your own flesh and blood. 
And then look what it says. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, Abram's a liar, isn't he? Going to put his wife in danger to spare his own. I mean, he's no hero. But God takes him out in the dark and the negative. I've had the privilege to be there and look up at the sky. Well, it's like you can touch him. And he says, Abram, I'm God. I've called you. So shall your offspring be. And at that moment, at that moment, we, we, we find out early on what living for God is all about. It's not about what you can do for him. It's about putting all your chips in his basket. That's it, baby. That's it. He believed God. And God called him righteous. Can I tell you something? Being justified by faith doesn't start with Jesus. It doesn't start with the cross. It doesn't start with the resurrection. It doesn't start with the apostle Paul. It started all the way back in Genesis. Come on, chapter 15. There's only one solution in this life, friend. It's to hold on to God with everything you have. That's plan A, B, C, D, E, and F. Hallelujah. The way out of your mess is to take him at his word and hold on as tight as you can. Amen. And so now, then, the Lord says to him, hey, listen, now I, I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abraham replied, oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I'm actually going to possess it? Now, think of everything you've learned about covenants, everything that was a part. I mean, this was so much a part of Abraham, he didn't have to think about it. It's just, it, was, it permeated the, the air he breathed. Look at what it says. The Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Abraham didn't have to ask any questions. He knew at that moment what was going to happen. <gasps> the God of the universe <laughs> wants to cut a covenant with me. Whoa. So Abram presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle. How did he know how to do that? Because he knew what was going on. This is his culture, his society. He, this is secondhand stuff. He cut each animal down the middle, laid the half side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in a half. Great day to be a turkey. Amen. Now, what happens here? Wow. Wow. The sun's going down. Abram falls into deep sleep. We're early in our reading. We've only read a week here. And already we've come to the second deep sleep. The second God-induced sleep, which tells us something really important is about to happen. Because the last time a guy fell into a deep sleep, he lost a rib, and women... <laughs> Hallelujah! Hold down, glory to God. So this is big stuff here. Now, Abram, not Adam, is in a deep sleep, right? And, and there's this terrifying darkness that comes over him. I mean, it is a nightmare, a nightmare, terror. Well, what would you expect if you go to sleep and the last thing you remember was the God of the universe is going to cut a covenant with you? So, here's what Abram saw. Check it out. It's on the screen. We've sanitized it a little bit. Listen to this. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord cut 
a covenant with Abram. Now, in a couple of weeks, we'll be reading through Exodus. We're going to run into the same, these are the same words and images on Mount Sinai when the mountain's on fire and the smoke is billowing from the mountain. This is the same image that we're going to find in a couple of weeks when we're reading through Exodus when the pillar of fire and the smoky cloud is guiding the Israelites through the wilderness. What is it representing? What is Abram seeing? He is seeing the presence of God. He is seeing God being manifested, walking the bloody path in between those ripped in half animals of the covenant. What's going on here? God himself, the Lord, the Suceroon, was passing through the pieces. Think about the, what you've learned in just 10 minutes about covenant in the ancient world. What's God saying when Abraham sees that? What does he know God is saying? Abraham, I've promised to bless you, to give you the land, to bring salvation to the world through you. And if I don't do it, may I become like these ripped in half animals. You got to drop your Bible. What? What? Amazing. Impossible. How could he do this? No way. But that's not all. Who don't you see walking through the bloody path? Abraham. Abraham's not there. Abraham is not there. Abraham doesn't walk the bloody path only the God of the universe walks the bloody path. You see, brothers and sisters, God, we know now, Abraham was just learning, right, that it's impossible for God to lie. God is a promise keeper. It is impossible for him to ever, ever back away from one promise he's ever made to us. It is impossible for him not to keep his promises. So who's he walking that bloody path for? He's not walking for himself. He's walking that path for Abraham. Hallelujah. Because down through the generations, it'll be proven over and over and over again that the descendants of Abraham cannot keep the covenants. Do you know what Abraham sees? He sees a foreshadowing of nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. What God is saying to Abraham is, Abraham, I'll take upon myself the curse of the covenant for you. I'm going to bless you, fulfill my promise to bless the world through you. I'm going to save the world through you. I'm going to reveal myself through you and your descendants, even if it means I have to die. And we know that's exactly what happened. Jesus would be celebrating the Passover with his disciples. Luke records on that Passover night before Jesus was going to walk the bloody path, he takes the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. After he was tried, convicted, scourged, given a cross to carry, the next day at high noon, the entire world turned dark, right? Or at least at that moment in that land. Darkness fell. Did that read it? Am I lying? Darkness fell over the earth as Jesus, the Son of God Himself, walked the bloody path for you and for me so that we could experience the blessing of not the old covenant, but a brand new covenant based on much better promises. Hallelujah. That today, not because of anything you can conjure up yourself, but only because of what Jesus has done for you. 
you can have a forever relationship with the Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Come on. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Jesus Be the Center. We're going to sing it quietly. I want to give you an invitation today. And I'm going to ask for anybody that leads, anybody that leads a life group, a fellowship class, anybody that's leading ministry, your assistant leader, pastors, deacons, former deacons, I'm going to ask you to lead the way. I'm going to invite people to fill the altar up right now because we're going to take, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to just bask in the gospel. This is the gospel. You can't do anything for yourself when it comes to the most important thing in life. Oh, you might be a good businessman. You know how to make money. Oh, you might be successful in school. You might have a lot going for you. You might, you might have a lot going for you, and that is all very good. But I can tell you, when it comes to the most important thing in life, like eternal salvation, you and I are complete losers. Complete losers. And I, pastors are always concerned, especially in America, where anybody can show up and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. We're always concerned that there's always people out in the congregation who started coming to church, but your church attendance is still about you trying to earn your salvation. You trying to think that if you bring your kids and if you come, you know, that somehow people are going to think you're good and it's going to be all right. I meet so many people. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, friends. There, I'll meet people from time to time. They just, they just can't quite get this. And they continue to just laugh. They can just languish. They keep stumbling. They keep falling. Mess after mess after mess after mess. Because the true gospel has never come to them. Where you have to, in humility, say, I am completely bankrupt. I cannot. I cannot do it. And then to know the unconditional love to realize God himself walked the bloody path for me. There's nothing like it. It's the gospel. And it's the gospel that saves us. So come on, let's start to sing Jesus Be the Center. And let's take the next few minutes and let's just bask in the wonder and the glory of the gospel. Come on. In Jesus' name, let's do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. So Jesus be center of my life, beginning, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, nothing else Folks, listen, when I invited the leaders, I meant leaders, you come first. But I want to invite, I want to invite everybody to make a move. I want to invite everybody to make a move. I, I, I want to invite, you know, I decree you're all leaders, whatever it takes. Do you know that no matter how long you've been living for Jesus, you've got to take a fresh bath in the gospel over and over again. Because it's not our default. Our default is do it better, try harder. Our default is, you know, you know, I got to try to live for Jesus. Friends, fooey on that. It doesn't work. Come on, amen. It's basking in the glorious, wondrous example of Jesus, amen, that he walked the bloody path for us. Come on, make a move. Come on, make a move. Let's fill this altar up. Come on, teenagers, I need you down here. Come on. Come on, let's flood this place up and let's take a bath in the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's sing it together. The gospel is our center. 
Jesus is our center. Come on, let's sing it. Amen. Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Say his name is Jesus. tear our self-centered pride in two would you would you tear that hard that hard crusty idea that that somehow that somehow we deserve salvation would you rip it in half come on amen would you rip it at God would you bring us to the glory of the cross and in afresh I pray for a church person here today who hasn't yet truly truly seen the bright light of the gospel, friend. If that's you, listen, we're going to sing this through one more time, and then we're going to pray a dismissal prayer. But friends, listen, there's a lot of people down here that could help you live for Jesus. If you'd like to, if you'd like to step into the family of God today, if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, you come down here with us. Come on, you come. Let's have some more people. Just make a move today. Make a move today. Let's sing it again. Make Jesus the center of your life. Let the glory of the gospel, the glory of new creation, the glory of new covenant and what God has done for you in Jesus' name. Let it come pouring into your heart right now. May you have the faith. May the faith of Abraham come pouring into your heart right now. Lord, I don't understand it all. I don't have it all figured out. But I take you at your word. I take you at your word. I run to you today. I, I'm going to grab on you. I'm going to hold on to you. That's my plan A, B, and C, and D. I, I, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to trust you for my salvation and for my family and for my life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. One more time. Come on, let's sing it through. Let's let it ring. Let's just let the glory, the wonder of new creation pour over us today. Amen. In Jesus' name, Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your Knees, Lord, I pray, God, for 
friends today, whether watching on the internet or right here in this room, who haven't yet responded to the true gospel in all of its brilliance and glory, all its wonder and majesty. May today be their day. Friends, just pray a prayer like this. God, I'm broken. God, I'm broken. I'm broken, God. I've tried and tried and tried. I keep making a mess of things. I thought I was doing the right thing coming to church, but all I was really doing was trying to put up a good front, and trying to still prove to people that I, I'm going to church. I can do it. We're going to, I, the good guy, God, forgive us. Break all the stony hearts today, Jesus. Bring us to the cross, Lord. Bring us to our knees in humility, God. I pray for that man, that woman, Lord, running from you. They'd know you're not mad, you're not angry. Your heart's broken and you long to bring them into the family. Today, may they step into the family of God. Ask them to forgive you. Repent, turn away from your old life. And grab onto Jesus with everything you have. Put your faith and trust in Him. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about, how am I going to do this? He's going to help you. It's all Him. It's not you. It's all Him. It's not you. We've got a bunch of leaders down here. And they, every one of them want to disciple other people. So you come before you leave today. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Help get you into a group. Get you, get you into some relationship to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name. Can we give it an amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus some praise. Hey, can we throw that last scripture up on the screen? That last scripture up on the screen. Come on, let's read it together. You ready? This is our prayer. Walk out of here with the word of God on your heart, on your lips. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so now, not in your own strength, but in all the resources you have through the new covenant, the Holy Spirit living inside of you, right? Amen. Your sins are forgiven. You've got purpose and a home in heaven. May we all walk out of here, not in our own strength, but centered in the gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus. May we walk out of here and may we live for him together. Amen. God bless you. Go live for him. Amen.